Welcome, 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 welcome to this broadcast. Mark DeJesus here looking forward to taking more of your questions. Yes, I enjoy questions and I enjoy tackling the difficult questions, the challenging questions, and I enjoy being able to address because here's the deal. We all have real issues, real struggles, real stuff that we're going through. And many times we don't really get down to the rubber meeting the road And I really think it's important. And so I enjoy listening to people address questions in ways that are helpful and fruitful. So I just pray that I can be a blessing to your life and to your journey. Anything that I address in this broadcast, and I'm going to be getting into mental health, Lord willing, the creek don't rise. I'm actually going to do another one tomorrow. And uh, we did have a significant amount of questions come in. So I'm not trying to replace any professional work or help that you're getting. My desire is to build you up and give you insight and some support for what you're going through. I've been through a lot. I've worked through a lot. I've learned a lot. I've been able to interact with many, many people and help them on their journey. So if I can be a blessing to your life, I want to be that. If there's anything that adds further confusion, just put it aside. God's not the author of confusion. He doesn't author confusion. He's not trying to confuse you. Certainly our enemy does, because he knows when we're in confusion, we lose our sense of stability. And so I'm seeking to help facilitate sound thinking. We live in a kingdom where God wants us to know how to live in power, love, and a sound mind and not be given into fear. And we have a world that is increasingly being held captive by fear. We're not of this world. We're of a different order. But we also have to still wrestle with fear issues in our life and wrestle with areas that of thinking that want to keep us from sanity. And I'm on a daily basis learning what kind of thoughts I have that lead me into power, love, and a sound mind, lead me into faith, hope, and love, that lead me in the truth that sets me free free, not keeps me more and more bound, provides more freedom. And I'm learning and I'm learning to detox thoughts that are not of God in my life. I'm learning to detox and and get set free and get sanctified and healed from and delivered from and set free of thought patterns I had ever since I was a little kid. I'm learning to get set free of thoughts I've had that have been in my family for thousands of years. I'm learning to get free of things that maybe I thought at one point I will never ever be able to get free from this. And I will never put a limitation on any thought in my life being a permanent thought system. I get to choose and I get to decide, but it's a journey of what it looks like to experience that freedom. So I pray that what I share can be a blessing to your life. I'm want more than anything else. I'm wanting you to feel loved and cared for. I, I don't want you to ever feel judged, condemned, shamed ever. Ever, 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 ever. Jesus died so that we could be free, not so that we could be more bound. And many of us in our mental health battles, we're bound because we're disconnected to love. We're disconnected to grace. We don't know what it's like. We've been we've been given a recipe that's put a burden and a yoke on us. And Paul taught in his writings about setting us free from those. And we, we can be free from the yoke of bondage. And I, was, I, I, I accepted Christ at a very young age. I was about four years old when I just said yes to Jesus. So I know what it's like to grow up in the church, but it wasn't until way later in my life that I actually learned what the love of God and the love of the Father was. So I'm sharing this, and many other Christians, many other believers, they're relating to that. And I truly believe with all my heart that our healing journey when it comes to mental health involves learning. First of all, we got to be hungry, humble, and teachable. We have to say, I want it, and we have to humble ourselves to be taught, and we have to pursue it. But what it's learning is learning to heal our relational grid, how we see God, how we see ourselves, how we see our world around us. And many of the questions that you've submitted revolve around that, and they involve our world of what we call mental health, but really 
It's relational health. It's learning to take a look at what we're thinking and allow God to set us free, that there's a new way of thinking. And it's challenging at times in our journey because the way God thinks is sometimes just so beyond our understanding. It's a mystery in many ways, right? But God is also very grounded, and he wants us to live in the fruit of love. We want to keep it simple. Do you know how to love? Do you know how to receive love? Do you know how to process love without fear getting in the way, without unworthiness and all this shame and stuff getting in the way? Well, then maybe coming to this Q&A is a good opportunity for you. So I pray that it'll be a blessing to your life, whether you struggle with some form of a mental health issue, depression, anxiety, OCD, schizophrenia, whatever, whatever kind of thing you have going on. If you position your heart to be teachable, God can meet you in that. But many times we have to relearn, who is it when I'm relating to God? And that's been a, a journey for me. And once I began to understand him as a father, boy, it brought everything slower, more heart connected, but it took time. And I'm continuing on that, always learning, always growing, always healing. It's, it's, it's a, healing is a continual process. Till my very last breath, I will still be healing. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I don't have to arrive. I don't have to arrive. I don't have to be something right now. Jesus paid a price for me. So I get to learn in his grace what his righteousness is. And I get, I get to go, hey, that's not. That's not thought of, not of God. I don't have to listen to that anymore. I can put that aside. I can, I can now enter into faith, hope, and love. I can walk this journey with God. Oh, I got this battle I'm going through. Boom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn to get to the root of it, get to the heart of it, so God can really set me free. So I can understand why, why I'm really doing these things. And I don't have to be condemned in the process because there is no condemnation in this journey. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of this, is that he's not condemning you, guilting you, shaming you, fearing you. He's not putting pressure on you. But that's what we often live in, right? We live under pressure. We live under all this discouragement. We live under all this anxiety, fear. And the tricky thing is if we attribute all that to God, then we're in big trouble. Because now we got a God that's trying to kill us and torment us. And he is just, man, he is just elbowing you in the head every chance he gets. So... Many times for us in the journey, it begins with knowing God as our Father. And that's, that's been the number one transformative work in my life, is knowing who God is as a Father. Because many times in our journey, we, we follow Jesus, we've given our lives to Jesus, but he said, I want you to know the Father. And we te- most of you know, Christianity teaches a basic fundamental belief of the triuneness of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? But do we know the Father? And I've been on a journey of helping people to understand the Father. What is it like to relate to him as a father? What does that look like? And then it gets back to our father experiences on earth and and, and healing those areas. And it can be a joyous adventure. It doesn't have to be just laborious, beating yourself down all the time. It's a grace journey. So I pray that you're encouraged in that. So today we're going to get into some questions, and I will do my best to give you some feedback. I'm not the wizard. I am not the guru. I am not the master of all answers. In fact, anyone who presents themselves as that, hmm, yeah. if they feel like they have all the answers or present themselves as the answer people, you know, take, take it with a grain of salt. We're all on a journey. But I do have a lot of treasured perspectives that I can give because I've been through some stuff and I've helped a lot of different areas of battlegrounds and issues and stuff. And I feel like there's times where I said, you know, I've seen everything when it comes to battlegrounds people have. And then I have a meeting with somebody. I'm like, okay, this is a new one. (laughs) So I won't say I've seen everything because when I say that, (laughs) something comes around the corner. They go, okay, roll up my sleeves. It's a new thing. So I'm going to get into some questions about people trying to control me. I'm going to get into some questions of the fear of judgment, self-censoring, How do I deal with people who are easily offended? How do you stop an anxiety trigger? Is it wrong to have distance from your family of origin? I have have a, a fear of God. I got guilt. And et cetera, et cetera. It's going to be a lot that we're going to get into. So I'll do my best to glance at some of the questions. Just to let you know, I'm going to get into OCD related questions 
mañana, tomorrow. So if your question had an OCD tangent, it's going to be tomorrow. So just letting you all know that so that you're aware, tune in tomorrow. I will, I will get to it then because many of them that came in were OCD related. And my wife and I did a whole Q&A on that. Make sure you listen to that. And then I'll get into more of that tomorrow. So first question here is, how do I deal with people who are trying to control me? I thoroughly enjoy listening to you guys and gleaning for your wisdom. Thank you very much. Over the past year, I have been betrayed, lied about, and attacked physically, emotionally, and mentally by people trying to control me. I'm a very athletic, tall, white man of 29 years, not the guy you'd think people would typically mess with. I'm running into more and more situations. I mostly think it's because my eyes are open to what is going on now. I'm running into more and more situations where people are trying to control me. They mostly try to manipulate me with their words and anger. Is there a certain type of personality or characteristic that controlling people gravitate towards? If so, what do you recommend I work to uncover and heal from? Please keep in mind my own struggles and subsequent healing from suffering abuse from a wife who shows all the signs of being a narcissist. Thank you for your time. Keep up the great message. Thank you very much. I'm glad that our message can be a help and blessing to your life. Okay. So I don't, when you say suffering from the, from my wife who shows all the signs of being a narcissist, I'm assuming you're currently still married. Um, many people use that word narcissist and it, um, sometimes it takes like some breakdown. Okay. Is it really narcissist? Cause narcissism is becoming like a, a word that we use. Oh, those people, so narcissist, but psychology has use that term to have a certain, there's a a number of certain characteristics that are needed for that to really be um, called that. But I also understand people have narcissistic tendencies for sure. But your real question comes down to, do people who are controlling gravitate towards people who are controllable? Yes. Yeah. And, And it's like, People who are, um, they, they will often say people who are abused in some kind of way, they can walk into a room with 100 people and 99 of those people are nice, but somehow they kind of land into that one person who's an, an abuser. And this is why I'm very, very big on helping people to understand the root of rejection. And it's in my book, Exposing the Rejection Mindset. Because what happens is the pain in our life often follows us so that we project it on our world. Because your mind, what your mind does is your mind narrows things down. Your your brain is constantly simplifying things, right? So that you can only focus on one thing at a time. You Your brain cannot focus on multiple things at a time. It's impossible. You can't think three thoughts at the same time. You can only think one thought at a time. When it might happen quickly, move from one to the other, right? So what often is the case is we develop certain filters and lenses so we can quickly process through life in a way of how we see our world and see people. The problem is, is that our woundedness gets in there and then that woundedness gets projected onto our world. So big one is betrayal. And Jesus said in the last days, betrayal is going to increase. People are going to be betrayed in epic numbers. He called it and it's happening. They will be hated, will be persecuted. It's like, we want to know what the end times are going to have. It, 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 he said it. I believe it's Matthew, was it Matthew 24? He said in, in those days, this hatred, betrayal of people will be easily offended. All this relational upheaval is going to happen. And then he says, and many false prophets will arise. How do false prophets arise? They arise out of unhealed brokenness. Every false prophet has unhealed brokenness in their life. Every false prophet has father issues that were never addressed. Show me the history of cult leaders, of false teachers, false religions, and I will show you in their history daddy issues. (laughs) Everyone. Everyone, could, you, you, you can find it, you know, that the either, either uh, brokenness regarding their father or they rebelled against what their father taught them. 
listen, it's it's the old record playing over and over again because Satan is the father of lies. He's wanting to be your daddy and he wants to overthrow the the father of truth, right? And so he wants to take our broken earthly father issues as a door point for that, right? So I sell this to say, Jesus is saying in the last days, there's going to be all this relational stuff that's happening. That's why I believe what we're talking about, I'm positioning myself for, uh, if you want to call it last days, kind of work for people because we need to get our relational world healed. We need to learn how to walk in better healing in our life. Hold on, we're having a technical issue. Sorry, folks, I just had uh, just a quick technical thing that I had to deal with. So anyways, so in this relational upheaval, okay, in this, in this arena where we are um, having these relational breakdowns, people betray you, they hurt you, they're bringing false things against you, they're bringing stuff against you that's happening, that's taking place, right? So in that, false prophets will arise. They'll lead you into stuff. What are they doing? They're not letting... They're not teaching people how to deal with their brokenness. They're not teaching people how to deal with their issues. So we get in all this entanglement, right? And it leads us into strife. So today that's what's happening now more than ever is is we're being immersed in strife, arguments, debates, back and forth, fighting and arguing. When you feel that arguing starting to rise up, note it's the strife happening. Okay, so what's my point? My point is, is is in exposing the rejection mindset This is the thing that's going on. Our wounds, listen to me, our wounds then get projected onto our world because our brain simplifies things and we create a filter. So you get betrayed, right? And that wound hits you. If that doesn't get healed and processed through, you will, that becomes a part of your filter. Look out for people that betray. Look out for people that betray. Look out for people that betray. So then it develops a self-preservation, self-survival mechanism in your life where you self-protect. So instead of relationally being open to love people, you're on guard. I better watch out, better watch out, better watch out. Your fight or flight kicks in and your, your sympathetic nervous system rises up and then you're on guard. Your parasympathetic nervous system doesn't kick in. So stress, stress, stress. Got to keep people at bay. Got to keep people away, right? It's fueled by rejection because there's a certain wound you don't want to see happen again. So you look at and you're anticipating this happening now with other people. So we develop certain things like uh, preachers just want your money or all men are jerks or all women uh, are, are controlling or all. We, we develop these blanket statements as self-protective mechanisms. Okay. So I say all this to say that you have had a lot this year where you've been betrayed, lied about, and attacked physically. I want to encourage you, allow God to heal those areas because otherwise you will transpose that now onto your world. Be very, very careful because that's the world we live in. Somebody will have an event and that event becomes now the theme in life that they portray on everyone. And rejection gets the upper hand because now it creates a limitation Because what people need is they need healing love. They need a person who's open to love, open to grace, open to forgiveness. But if we're locked into self-preservation and self-survival, we won't be able to allow our heart. See, these the self-protection creates a protective wall. And at first, it's normal. It's normal, right? Something happens, you kind of protect, right? If somebody, you know, jumps you and you get robbed, you try to protect yourself in the moment. Right, And then it may take some time for you to come down. right? But then over long periods of time, the unhealed of that being robbed could create now this constant hypervigilance of anticipation. That's often our trauma response, that hypervigilance. We're on the lookout, on the lookout, on the lookout, on the lookout, on the lookout. Now, it may, you may feel like you're protecting yourself, but you're not available for love. You're not available to flow in love. And so that's, that's the thing in this journey that I want us to understand. That's the thing that I want us to be able to 
heal and work through is first of all, go, I can't control the world, nor do I want to take my brokenness and portray it on the whole world. I want to heal on how I'm seeing things. And that's the rejection filter. I want to allow God to heal me because otherwise I'm going to carry a filter that I will deem to be true. All these kind of people are this, all this is that, all this, this. We create this lens and it increases self-protection, it increases hatred, and it increases what Jesus said, the love of many growing cold. And so I want to be able to work on those filters, work on those areas so that God can heal me so I don't keep anticipating rejection. Okay? Otherwise, I'm going to get deeper here. Otherwise, and I found this, I found this in my life. I found this in many people I've worked and helped with. Otherwise, we can develop forms of paranoia in our life. That's a strong word, I know. Paranoia is a real strong word. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say you're all paranoid schizophrenic. That's not what I'm saying. Paranoia is a part of paranoid schizophrenia. It's a part of it, right? It's a part of the battle. I've worked with people who've had, had those kind of struggles. The paranoia is an intense, hypervigilant kind of fear that can lead us to a false reality. So beware of believing everyone's trying to control me. Everyone's trying to hurt me. Everyone's after me because it can alter reality. And many times in mental health battles, we give into, and, and many people I work with, they're getting this and, and they're saying it. And I'm like, yes, it's good you recognize that. They're saying, I'm believing an alternate form of reality. In fact, many people in obsessive compulsive religious obsessive compulsive, they are feeding an alternate world of reality. And so when you try to talk to them and say, no, 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 you don't have to be afraid of contamination. No, you don't have to be phobic about sin. You don't have to obsess about your salvation. They're like, no, 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 I need to, I need to. What is that? That is an altered reality. And they won't let you speak into a healthy reality, right? That's why we need relationship and Satan wants to separate relationship because if he can separate you relationally, we become a standard to ourselves, right? So it's like, here's what I think is true and, and no one can ever say anything and this is, and, and, and isolate, 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 isolate. I discovered this even in working with paranoid schizophrenia, and I'm not trying to say I know everything about it or anything like that, but I noticed there, there was a, like a relational isolation in their life. And they were listening to a reality that they were deeming to be true and nothing else could sharpen it. A part of my mental health journey is learning to process thought, share it with someone that I trust who knows my heart, hear feedback, and the, big, the best place to do it is with my wife because she knows my heart. I call her my second Holy Spirit because I'll share something. And there are times she's like, meh, that's, I, think, eh, I don't know. Like, okay, and I allow that to be a place where I could sharpen. I, I very, so to answer your question, going back to your question, yes, we can gravitate towards people that are controlling, but what I would focus on is healing the rejection wound of at times being controlled, betrayed, because in other ways, you're going to constantly anticipate it, look for it, search it, and you're going to seek to self-preserve yourself from it, but it, it, it's funny because we'll try to self-survive and we still end up landing in those kind of things anyways. Why? Because rejection always wants to be rejected. And when I have an unhealed rejection wound, it looks for it, it seeks it, it wants it, it craves it, right? So I had to realize re the rejection wounds created limitations. There's a, there's a chapter in there that I, in the Rejection Mindset book, where I talk about the limitation, the limiting mindsets that rejection brings about. It's a whole chapter. And I encourage you to work through it because it creates certain beliefs that then we project on our world. We look for it. We, we search it out. Remember, your brain is just simplifying. You walk into a room. How many of you walk into a room and you go, everyone's looking at me? They're not looking at you, but you had maybe one person look at you and you went, they don't like me. So someone said, one person says something mean to you on social media, everybody's mean, right? That's often our brain does that. It, it, it will take something and it uses it as our, as our filter now for life, right? For everyone. Beware of that because it can form an altered reality that then you're now focused on. And what you focus on is what you'll look for. What you look for, you will find. 
Like I said, you can have 100 people in a room and 99 of them love you. One person hates you and you see their hatred. When you walk out of the room, what do you think about? Right? I remember when I would lead worship and uh, be on at stage and big crowd, you know, and you're, you're leading worship in songs. What would I often be drawn to? The one person that was standing in the audience like this. And it was like, they could be standing like this because they just had a fight. He just had a fight with his wife and he's frustrated. He doesn't know what to do. But my rejection filter took it as he doesn't like what I'm singing or he doesn't like my worship leading. Mm. See how nasty rejection is? My rejection filter interpreted, first of all, I didn't pay attention to the wonderful things happening in the room, the great joy and presence of God that's at war. I'm narrowed in on the one because that's my wound looking for it. Ah, my wound's looking for it. My wound looks out for the negative and my wound looks out for that and focuses on it. And then that becomes the narrative I carry away. Oh, that guy there, you know, people in that room, they just won't really see. And when we follow God, we have to know how to look for him. He says, in darkness, the glory of the Lord shines. But it's not like you just walk in the day and it's glory is just shining everywhere. No, there's a lot of darkness. It's a deep darkness will cover the earth. But you have to look for the glory. You have to look for him. So healing the rejection wound helps me to look for God. So I would highly recommend, you mentioned um, the betrayal, the lied about, attacked. You got some, probably some trauma here. You've been attacked physically. You know, you've been, you, you know. But what I don't want to encourage is you developing now a profile that you're just going to be controlled all the time. And I want, I want to break that off of your life so that you can heal. That happened to you, but it's not who you are. And you can walk forth in a new identity. And so, but we have to be aware of paranoia because in our traumas, in our hurts, in our pains, I've experienced this where I'm like, whoa, I'm starting to think somebody's out to get me. You know, it can lead to delusions of uh, persecution. Many times uh, Christians can have a self-martyr. Everyone's after me. Um, beware Christians if we have that martyr complex. It's not true martyrs. It's a martyr complex, right? We exaggerate. Uh, maybe our importance. Oh, God has got to call on me and people just don't understand me and those kind of thoughts and those kind of patterns. And it can cause us to lose touch with reality. It can cause us to be disconnected to our world of reality. So hope this makes sense and hope this lands. I'm going to move on to the next question. Give me just a second here. I just got to... Check something. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question here. How do I work through the fear of judgment and self-centering? The fear of judgment can be really crippling. Yes, it can, for sure. I knew at the root of it is a fear of rejection. It makes me less bold and feel cowardly when it comes to expressing my opinions. This in turn suppresses me as an individual, which means I am dulling down who I am. This causes a domino effect of negative emotions towards myself. I feel it contradicts my confident, sociable personality. How do I run towards this fear? Or is it safer to be more equipped before I start? Um, I'll, I'll say this in reply. I haven't finished the question, but... It's never, you're never going to get fully safe and then start. I would start now, <laughs> moving towards this fear. How do you run towards a, a fear like this? I mean, I'll get more into the, I'm sure you'll address more of it later. When you, I, I found in my life that if I'm talking to someone while also editing, it's going to jam up the flow. You know, I have a lot of experience in this because with uh, battles with OCD, I'll talk and I'll be editing what I'm saying and auto-correcting. It's like auto-correct, you know, in your Word documents. It's like auto-correct is like on, you know, ha happening on its own while I'm talking. It just doesn't work. The way to talk is be fully focused and free to let it out. 
because that's where heart vulnerability expression and we learn in the doing. We're all so perfectionistic. We want to like make sure we say everything right and no wonder we're struggling because we're editing while we're expressing. Even in, um, even in circles, I'm a writer and I write books and authors will say when you write, when you first write, don't edit while you're writing. Just flow. Just write and just flow. And then come back and edit later. Why? Because in order to f- creatively flow, you have to just express it out with no filter. I say this a lot in coaching sessions. I go, say it and don't filter it. Because they'll go, oh, I'm sorry. I sh- I stop it. Just say it. If you can't be safe here to express it, where can you be safe? Just say it. Right? Now, I'm not just telling you in relationships, go around and just dump the truck everywhere. We know we're learning. But um, it seems that you are... Um, you, you're, you're constantly judging yourself. You say, when I've experienced judgments before, I, I go to pieces, like the biggest catastrophe ever, right? When people judge us, it's painful. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a sign that they're just not gracious and they're not safe in how they process people. So um, fear of rejection has become a cliche term as a feebleness or weak person, which I don't feel that I am. I'm confident in a lot of my form views. And so I feel I censor myself in order to feel safe, but I often feel so frustrated. Although I never compromise a view or decisions based on that fear. If it comes to it, I will and have suffered the consequences of people's judgments in these instances, but it takes it out of me. So the question is, how do I work towards owning and expressing my views without feeling that my world might fall apart? Well, first of all, don't feel the pressure that you have to express your views. I think many times Christians, we have a compulsion that we have to say something. And many times we don't need to say something. I would like to encourage more and more people relationally. You don't have to jump in and speak to everything that arises. Social media has conditioned us that we got to respond to things and we got to say something. And if you don't, there's a problem. No. How about in the Bible where it says, Jesus spoke not a word? Everybody on social media be angry. Jesus didn't say anything. You know? Yeah. Especially when judgment, condemnation, guilt, and accusation is in the place. You feed it, it's a monster that'll keep growing. So I think that you kind of have to look and go, okay, expressing our views, we really need to express our views when somebody actually wants to hear it. That's what I'd first say. Is this person want to hear what I have to say in this situation? Or am I pushing my opinion? Because then now it sets me at ease to just be myself and just wait for the right environment to express, right? And then when I express, I don't want to feed beating myself up afterwards. Now, if there's something I can learn, I'll learn. But I often find that when we're in a relationship and we're we're speaking and we're vulnerable, many times we could beat ourselves up afterwards, right? Oh, I should have said that. Because you're being vulnerable. And that vulnerability is a good thing. And I had to learn, there were times where I would share something and I was like, oh, I got vulnerable and that person didn't receive it. And they gave me the weird look and I'd walk away going, oh, spinning. Right. Then I learned, and and Melissa and I have encouraged each other in this. I've learned, no, I celebrate that I took a step. I celebrate that I was vulnerable. I celebrate that I gave it a shot. Didn't work out, in my opinion, the best way, but I celebrate that I took a shot. Vulnerability is something that if you took it, you know, if you took a step and tried to express your art and it didn't work out, that's not the time to go, oh, I'm never going to do that again. I'll never talk. You know, we do these vows and all this stuff that we just will never, ever, 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 ever. No, chill out, chill out. Why not celebrate the fact that you took a step of faith? Because we learn in the doing. Ladies and gentlemen, we learn in the doing. We learn in taking action. We learn in applying. You don't learn, 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 then do. That's that's modern culture. That's not how heart, God working in your heart works. Modern culture is, I need to learn something, so I will sit in a class. Oh, I got my bachelor's. That doesn't mean you learned anything. I got my master's. Doesn't mean you learned anything. Got my doctor. Doesn't mean you learned anything. (laughs) I know that that's a strong opinion. It doesn't mean you learn anything. It means you have a lot of information that you can regurgitate. It doesn't mean 
You could, you could, you could know everything about the psychological impulses of somebody, but not know how to help any human being. <laughs> right? I'm not against degrees and masters and doctorates. Right? But we live in a culture that you want to learn something, read a book. Now that's good. Reading's good. Read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it. Okay, that was good. Did, did you take time to marinate it in your heart? No, but I read it. It was good, right? Church services, same thing. Oh, it's a great message. What was the message about? I don't know, but it was really good. <laughs> okay. Something's, something's got something's to shift here. So, so anyways, <laughs> going, to the, going to the deeper stuff, going to the learning and the journey. So let, let me move on. Let me move on. I went on some tangents there, which is good. Tangents are good. This question's longer, so I don't, I don't, I'll do my best to address it. But it's basically how to, how do I deal with people who are easily offended? It is difficult for me to speak up and say my opinion. I've lived in fear of others and anxiety for all of my life, and your videos have helped me chip away at these issues. Excellent. Glad to hear that. But I know that the Lord put these people in my life for a reason who do get defensive and offended if I were to ever disagree with them. Okay, I want to pause here. I want to pause here, this statement you said. And this is the stuff that I, that I get into that I like to bring out to people. You make this statement. I know the Lord put these people in my life for a reason. Can we just let that go? Why do we have to say the Lord put them in your life? That's, that's a lot of like, that's a big stamp. So I, I, I don't know that I have to say, yes, the Lord put them in your life. You may have some people that you need to move away from them in relationship. They're not healthy people. But if you start with the Lord put them in your life, then you're kind of in this like, it can kind of box you in. I'm just saying, we put a lot of the Lord told me, the Lord put, the Lord put, the God told me, the Holy Spirit said, the Lord, the Lord said, and God did, the, you know, we put a lot of it like this heavy weight for a lot of reasons. We want to feel like we're, you know, we want to feel like we're, I don't know, like we're hearing from God perfectly or, or something like that. So Jesus actually warned in the last days, like people being offended easily. It's actually the hook of what causes a lot of people to like, you know, fall by the wayside because they get offended, get resentful, get bitter. Um, the deception comes out of unhealed bitterness, right? So I'm actually working on some new material about the growing toxicity in our world relationally and how to like live a more, you know, free life in the midst of it. Because I think I'm very passionate about how do we navigate these anger issues and these battles and these people with negativity and stuff like that? So I don't know. These, the people that you're talking about, they may not be people that you need to have around you. So I'm not going to go into the saying, you know, stamp the Lord has them here. And I know sometimes I pick out certain phrases, but um, I like to bring insight to some stuff. So they get defensive, they get offended. Okay, so start with that. So I have to ask myself the question, well, am, am I a bull in a china closet? Am I pushing them over with my opinion? You know, am I forcing my opinion? Because I don't need to force my opinion. Uh, I, I don't have to feel the compulsion to have to say something in every situation, right? So I'll move on. I have two individuals in my life who do this, my sister and my friend. So the sister, there's the family stuff, right? That gets really difficult in processing the things of God and family. And then there's your friend, right? So you got the family and you got friend. In both cases, they seem eager to share their opinion and ask for mine. But when I do give mine and I met with this harsh defensive attitude and behavior, it's hard to not take it personally. Well, well first of all, if they ask for your opinion and then they're harsh and defensive back, they don't really want to hear your opinion and they're not safe to process with. So right there, I go, eh, I, I, I shared my deep convictions and personal opinions with those who are asking and those that are in a place where they're wanting to lean into what I have to say. It's so freeing to go, I don't have to sh share these treasures with everyone. I want to share with those who, who want to hear. And that's, that's my calling is I'm sharing insights and help for those who want it. If you don't, you want to argue, fight, keep moving right along. 
I got, I'm not, I'm not into any arguing. I'm not into, I used to be, I used to be in debating and defending and I got to do that. That's where the insecurity rises up. You feel like you got to say the right thing in response and all that. That's the part that God's healing. It's like, no, it's not my job to convince everyone and to be the one to, you know, to get everything just right or, or to think in better ways. Um, and so they're, they're right there at the jump. They're not showing safety in that way. So you say it's hard to not take it personally. I struggle with not being codependent in those relationships. The codependency probably gets fueled in the way they respond, and then you do something to try to make it better. I got I to gotta try to make it better so they're happy with me. That's the rejection cycle. That's the codependency. Um, and she said not being codependent and giving them the space to seek the Lord about it. That's, that's a better answer. But in both these scenarios, I've spoken up in the past and I was met with gaslighting. Now, gaslighting is a, is a term associated with narcissistic relationships. And it's, it's, it's somebody who is communicating an altered reality than what is true. And it's a, man, a very, very, um, very dangerous, dark practice that is um, very, very broken people that are disconnected from their world. They communicate a false reality. So again, narcissism gets used a lot. Gaslighting gets used a lot. So um, we just want to uh, define what you're, you know, when you use that term, it's they're, they're presenting an altered reality. So it's like you went, you went to the grocery store yesterday and they said, no, we didn't. We went to the pharmacy yesterday, you know, and, and, it's, you know, it fuels a lot of lies and things like that. I'm not trying to give you a perfect definition of gaslighting, but anyways, I'm feeling so stuck in these relationships. I feel very controlled. Okay, you you should never feel stuck in a relationship. Right there, you you, you you there's there's something that's tying you to the friend and the sister. That hey, why don't you just step away and let God do some healing? Let it let it, let these relationships be for a little bit. I get physical pain because of the anxiety and hypersensitive to their needs, such as responding to them as quickly as possible so that they can't get offended. Yeah. I have two recommendations. I would encourage you go through my series on soul ties and codependency. You can go back, go through my podcast archive page and go, th- and go there and go work on the rejection mindset, rejection, rejection, rejection. A lot of these things that we're going to get into today is the rejection route because you're going to them with a neediness and you're tied to them. You need something from them that you're um, dysfunctionally tied to. In both cases, these people have been in my life for years. So, so the history is adding to this. And my friend and I went through a lot. Difficult for me to understand my friend because she truly believes that conflict is necessary in relationships to grow. Yes, that's true. And we need to work through conflict, providing that we both have a heart to reason together. If you don't have a heart to reason together humbly, you don't have anything in conflict resolution. And once you have that, you need to, when you, when you see that it's not there, it's the time to go, okay, just need to let this be for a little bit because otherwise you're going to try too hard. You're going to try too hard. You're going to try too hard. And out of your rejection, you're going to try to see that person uh, get better. And you're going to take the burden of the relationship on your shoulders. So, uh, it's difficult for me to understand my friend because she truly believes a conflict is necessary in relationships to grow them and it will arise because we are imperfect humans. True, providing that we're going to work through it. But she doesn't understand that so much conflict and hurt can be avoided by not becoming self-focused and actually trying to understand the other person's point of view. I've prayed in the past that the Lord would somehow end our friendship. Yeah. The Lord is not going to jump down and end your friendship. He's not a puppet master. He's not going to come in and go, blow the whistle and go, this relationship is over. Um, you decide what you do with your relationships. You decide. That's your, that's your decision. That's your decision. And um, it's okay to say, just, you, you don't even have to give them an s- official speech. You can just go, I, you know, I'm involved in some other things right now. I'm just busy. Or you may need to come to a place where you say, you know what? I feel like we have a lot of conflict. I, I need to work on some things in my life. I just need, I need a break for a little while. You know? And people that are healthy go, oh, man, if I've done anything, I'm so sorry. Or they go, you know what? I understand. You know, take your time. You know, 
we'll connect at some point, right? Healthy people respond that way. They either go, hey, I'm sorry if this affected you, if there's anything I can do, right? Or, you know, they go, I understand. If they, if they, if they, if it gets to respond host, hostile, with hostile reactions, hmm, kind of shows what's going on. Because I'm a big believer in that, like a relationship, we put a lot of force on relationships. Relationships either flow or they don't. It takes work, for sure. But I deal with a lot of people that are overexerting themselves and trying to fix and trying to get people. We're very codependent, trying to get people to see our view and to make the relationship better in the name of love. We're like we're trying to be loving and I'm, I want to reconcile and we're taking scriptures and twisting them. And it's like, no, you're bearing the whole load of this relationship. Why don't you just let it be, release it to the Lord and see what God does? You know, why am I yelling? Am I yelling? I feel like I'm yelling. I pray that the Lord would somehow end our friendship because it causes me so much stress, but we are still friends somehow. I just still feel like I can't be a good friend to her if I'm not sharing my honest opinion. And Yeah, I, well, I think intimacy in a relationship will go to the level of honesty that's in the relationship. The level of honesty will determine how far the relationship can go. How far a marriage can go, how far a friendship can go is a level of honesty. And most relationships, they kind of cap at a certain level of honesty. How honest can we be with each other? At that cap, and, and it's okay if someone's at a certain place, then you kind of go, okay, is this the level that I can interact with? Because some people, it's just, it's an acquaintance. You see them every now and then, but you can't go any deeper. And it, it's, it's not showing it can go deeper. Okay, so that's the interaction we're going to have at that level. And I'm not going to put an expectation to go more than that because it doesn't have what it takes. How many of you with your relationship questions, you need to accept that this person cannot go with you to the place that you want them to? I said, go, we're right there to Jesus. Tell you what, tell you what, tell you what, some good stuff in here. Just checking out some of the comments in the comment section. Just some more OCD stuff. OCD stuff I'll do tomorrow. We'll get to some of that tomorrow. Christians are very highly prone to OCD issues for sure. All right, let me get to the next one. How do... How do you stop an anxiety trigger? When a thought comes and triggers an anxiety response immediately, how can you stop these symptoms from taking over and spiraling you out of control? You don't. That's, um, that's part of the problem. Is you're trying to stop it. You're trying to prevent it from ever happening. So then that makes things worse because then when it happens, you're, you're worked up over being worked up by something that, trig that, that triggered you. you have to emotions are something that have to be worked through. We're always just trying to prevent them. No, 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 no. I'm not going to feel, I'm not going to feel that. I'm not going to feel that. That makes it worse. And it's like that trigger comes in. It's not stopping the trigger. It's how you respond. Mental health gets so much more improvement when you learn to respond to your symptom with compassion. This one sentence could really help many people. Mental health gets dramatically improved. Not in an instant. So stop taking things I say with like instant. It may take a while, but it dramatically can improve. When you respond to your symptoms with compassion, it's okay that I'm not okay right now. I'm going through something. I got to take a second. Okay, it's all right. It's all right. I had to learn because the like even like panic and anxiety come in like a wave. And when the wave comes up, we can either go, I'm going to drown. Or we go, oh, I'm going through something. It's all right. It's all right. I'm okay. And we become a friend to ourselves in the wave, in the process. I was my, I was my own worst enemy. Now I've become 
a friend to myself and my thoughts. Compassionate. Hey, Mark, you've been through this before. You're going to get through this. So whether, even if I, if something arose in me today, I have the tools of response. We're always trying to like prevent anything from ever happening. I don't want to feel that. We're, we're very afraid of emotions. Christians are very afraid of emotions and we're afraid of sin. We're afraid of emotions and we're afraid of sin. And so it doesn't allow us to deal with what we need to deal with because we're just in constant like, ah, you know. So the anxiety trigger happens. It's okay. And, but you learn, you learn what's, you know, what's really fueled my fears. That's why I've developed all the materials I have that I will not fear anxiety disorder stuff. All that stuff is walking you through learning, helping your discernment to be mindful, helping you to recognize certain patterns in your life, helping you to recognize when certain anxieties happened and so forth, right? So it's not about stopping it. It's about a compassionate response because in compassion, you start to learn what you need to learn, face what you need to face. Right in the middle of my heart healing journey book, I have three chapters and this is, this is just prime real estate Four, because I have a chapter on the power of self-acceptance, the power of patience, the power of kindness. Those three things working in play, and they're three separate chapters. And uh, I, I've been sending it, you know, free links out to those audio chapters like crazy. Just go, hey, just listen to this. Just listen to this, because it's the key. And we go to fix. I got to fix this. No, nope. you got to go through it. You got to go through it. You got to learn. So... Somebody says, uh, do you got stuff on BDD? All these abbreviations. You're talking about, I don't know, you'd have to say, like, I'm, 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 is it, you're probably talking about body dysmorphic disorder? <laughs> yeah. I'm not an expert on all the titles, you know. No, BPD is border, borderline personality. B, D, D, body, I'm assuming body dysmorphic. Yeah, that's where, um, yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. Big, big problem. And I would recommend in my book, God Loves Me and I Love Myself, I dedicate a chapter on how to see yourself the way that God sees you as his beautiful creation. And I break down Psalm 139, where David got a glimpse of God's glory by looking at himself. <laughs> and that gets that get a ton of religious people going, what? What are you talking about? Yep, it's in the Bible. Psalm 139. David looks at his body, whether he was looking at himself like this or he was looking in some mirror. He said, I praise you because I'm wonderfully made. We can't even comprehend that. We're in such, oh, my nose is too big. My head's too big. My butt's too big. I got to lose 20 wrinkles. And all that self-hate and self-hate and self-hate and self-hate and self-hate and self-hate, right? Meanwhile, God's going, I, I see you as glorious. You want to see me the, see you the way I see you? Get a hold of what David, when he looked at him. Now, now remember, David was a ruddy looking dude. He was not impressive. Saul looked like the king, right? He would say, we want a king. Oh, he looks like a, he looks like a king kind of person. And God was like, I want a man after my own heart. But David was ruddy looking. I don't know what ruddy looking means, but he wasn't just like, <laughs> but he had a connection in Psalm 139 healed so much of my heart because I hated what I saw in the mirror. And I said, I'm going to come into agreement with what you see. I'm wonderfully made. I'm wonderfully made. Yeah, I have flaws and quirks and things and stuff that don't always work or whatever. <laughs> you know, you might be like my ears or teeth or eyes or neck or belly, whatever. Have your little flaws or things, you know. Do you notice though when you see through the eyes of love? 
Like when I, you know, look at my kids and they got like a little, like a freckle or something like that. I go, oh, that's so cute. And they go, oh, you just say that because you love us. Well, of course, but, you know. When you have love, you see flaws with endearment and compassion. When you have hate, every flaw is magnified. That's what you focus on, and it becomes a deterrent. So we have body dysmorphic disorder to ourselves and other people. We're picking out flaws in people and all this. We're picking out the flaws in others because of what's within us, our own self-hate. So I, the message in this book saved my sanity. It, it really did. Because I'd made a decision, because love is a decision. I made a decision I was going to love myself the way that God loves me. I, and I was just going to say yes to it. And I was going to start acting and living in a way that welcomed it. And it, it, it led me on a journey of getting free from a lot of garbage I carried in my life and how I saw myself. But boy, it, it can hide really easy in Christianity. It really can. So let me move on. Got some more questions. I got some time here. Is it wrong to have distance from your family of origin? So it looks like there's a bunch of questions in this. I'll do my best. What does honoring parents and particularly difficult in-laws mean? Ooh, here we go. Here we go. Got some in-law stuff. How to maintain a robust joy despite difficult family relationships. What are the clear boundaries to operate within? I'm already sensing some of this perfectionism. Give me the rule. Give me the rule. Give me the rule. Remember, we're talking about relationships. We want the 10 rules on how to deal with toxic families. When you're searching for the right perfect rule, it's like, no, we're learning and figuring this out. Is it okay to not pursue relationship with extended family? Um, I don't, I don't have a blanket answer for that. You know, if you just have pure hatred for the family and you're not working through that, no, it's not good. If they're not peaceable and when you're around them, they're not willing to be at peace and you've tried over and over again and you're like, okay, I just, just can't right now. I don't believe in like black and white forever kind of rules. Like I believe more in like, you know, I need a break. Let's, let's let God just do his thing. You know, sometimes when we create black and white rules, I'm never going to speak to them ever again. It's like, well, God could do a work, but it's not on my shoulders. I'll just let it be right now. But I want to love, but, but we have so much of our family driven by guilt. Most of our dysfunctional family patterns are driven by guilt. I feel bad. So I feel bad. So, so we can't listen to love because we're, we're listening to guilt. Did y'all hear me? You can't listen to love because you're listening to guilt because guilt's loud, right? This is what love sounds like. It's nice to have you here. This is what guilt sounds like. Why weren't you here last week? Why weren't you here before? Oh, you, you don't think we're important? <laughs> you notice how one's louder and one says a lot. Love is just more simple. It's good to have you here. You know, God doesn't put guilt on you. You didn't do your devotions yesterday, so you do them today, and God's not going, you know, you weren't here yesterday. He just goes, glad to see you. Come on in. Yeah, but God, I did it. Yeah, just come on in to, to the table. But God, I don't know. I didn't. God's going, will you stop it? We got some good, some good meat, some good steak to eat here. <laughs> got some good food. Yeah, but God. Guilt, guilt, guilt. So, I do find, though, that, okay, you're bringing it. There's two things here. There's in-laws, and then there's family of origin. You will find that your in-laws will often kick up a lot of issues in your life. And I'm not saying all the time, and I'm not saying it all bad. I'm just saying there will be those things that will kick up, usually your rejection issues. And it's an opportunity for God to heal that. Now, it's not your job to save your in-laws. It's not your job to fix your in-laws. But I... But I um, I think it may be some signals of what, what can I work and heal through. doesn't mean I have to put myself in abusive situations. Then there's your family of origin. And I believe everybody at some point needs to be released by their family of origin. They need to leave father and mother so they become their own person. That leave is very important because many people didn't really fully leave so that when they cleave, they don't know how to really be one with their spouse because they haven't really left because you got to leave it. Because then you become your own sovereign person, now responsible for you 
where your parents aren't hovering over your life while you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s. That the dynamic is meant to change when they release. And I, I believe that needs to be um, important in all our journey. Did your parents release you? Did you have that moment of transition where like, this is the time? Most people know. They just left. Maybe they left on a bad note or they just just went to college and it was like kind of just get thrown into the ocean, right? So um, is there a moral component expectation God has about how close we try to be with family of origin, brothers and sisters, parents? Um, if they are willing to be reasonable, then meet them at that level of reasonability. If they're not Christians, but they're willing to be peaceable, you, you can meet people at their peaceable willingness. And it's like, they're like, I don't want to hear about God. Like, fine. That's fine. You're not going to be my God person to talk about God things. And I'm going to find that community elsewhere anyway. So it's okay. Now, if they're, if they're not willing to be at peace, to have a gathering, if they're always stirring up strife, stirring up strife, then be aware. Uh, you know, the Bible does talk about being aware of divisive people scorners, fools, mockers. They're just not willing to be reasoned with. And the writings to the, um, the epistles, like the pastoral epistles, a lot of the instruction to church leaders is just be aware of strife, be aware of arguments, don't get entangled. Don't argue about holidays, festivals, this and that, and we get lost in it. Most Christian discussions on social media are stuff we don't need to be arguing about making us more filled with strife, making us less fruitful, making us less loving, and our relationships are eroding. And we're like, God, God, what's happening? Because, so I have to say, okay, here's what I do. In Whether it's family, I assess how far can I go with this person? And if I go, okay, this is where it is kind of the lid, First thing I do is I accept that. I accept that's where it is. Because we get angry, we expect more. They can't give it. So this is, I accept it. Now, are they willing to reason at that level? If it's like you get together and you talk about sports and the game and stuff like that, and that's all they can do. Then we get together and talk about the game and sports and that's it. Have a nice time. Talk about the game. Right? You get together for Thanksgiving and they just watch the football game and they love talking about the game. But if you talk about deeper things or the heart and they just, all right, they don't want to accept that. Now, if they're people who stir up strife, then you know they're not a safe person and there's certain things they're just not safe to share with. Now, the real key, the real take home answer to this question is you and your spouse need to be on the same page in how you approach family because you are one flesh. You are a sovereign, independent unit under God, you and your marriage, you are under God. You are under no jurisdiction than Jesus Christ, right? I'm not saying don't get counsel, don't get help, don't get feedback, don't, you know, but I'm just talking about you're a, and I respect that in a marriage. You've left father and mother. You are a sovereign unit now under Christ, who is the head, who is submitted to the father, right? And Paul talked about that, right? So in that, you need to be on the same page in how you handle in-laws over here and in-laws on the other side, right? How you approach and be strategic. Now, in marriage, we're often very defensive of our family of origin, right? You can go, oh, man, my parents and stuff like this. Somebody else says the same thing. Go, hey, we get defensive, right? We are usually defensive of the the demonics and dysfunction of our family of origin. We have to be aware of that. And sometimes your spouse can call out things in your family of origin that you don't see. Woo, that's deeper next level stuff. I don't know if y'all are even ready for that. <laughs> I don't even know if you're ready for that discussion. But that's my feedback. If my extended family were not biological, if my extended family were not biological in the natural, I probably would not choose them for friends. I think most people would say that. Does that mean? No. I think, I think a lot of people would say that. Or, or even want to be around them. Yeah, I think a lot of people would say that. Is it wrong to have distance with family of origin? No. 
No, it's not wrong. To have your space. Um, just, just be aware of it not being black and white. Like we have to have a great relationship or nothing at all. And I'll never be with you ever again. It's like maybe just, uh, just space it out a bit. It's okay. And you may have certain windows in your life where you need extra space for whatever reason. It happens. I've walked through that. I've had to work, navigate through that. And God will, providing that you're, you know, working through some healing and not just shutting it off and tuning it out and not ever dealing with anything in your life. So let me move on. Hope this is helpful and a blessing to your life. Just checking through some of the questions. And some people that aren't productive, you may get put in timeout. You may just, we just remove them if they're not helpful. We, you know, like I said, we don't encourage like getting counseling advice from people in comment section, you know, we encourage each other. I mean, you know, do your thing. Most of you, you know, are great, but you know, just, yeah, I see a little spammy stuff going on. Took care of that. There are moments when perfectionistic tendencies appear. How can you distinguish when you're operating in excellence or perfection? The first sign is usually pressure. Perfectionism has pressure. Excellence is giving the best with what you have and where you're at. That's how I define excellence. Giving the best you have with where you're at. The best you have with where you're at. So I'm not trying to give of what I don't have. I am also not trying to give something when I'm in a season that I need to understand. You know, some of you are trying to like make something happen and it's not taking into consideration your season. Excellence is giving the best you have with what you have. Perfectionism has pressure to it. Stress and never enough. And I got to get things just right. A lot of perfectionism in Christianity. How do you know when you're too dependent on your parents? Well, if you're an adult, you leave father and mother. You become an adult now. So somewhere somewhere 17 to 20, that transition needs to happen. And um, you move into a new stage of your journey. And you may need to get some help and input from someone who can give you that feedback. Okay, so where are we at here? I have an unhealthy fear of God. All right, let's do this. I have an unhealthy fear of God. Yeah, yeah, we, this is a big, this is a big problem. The fear, you know, being afraid of God. I feel like everything I enjoy, I have to give up. So I'm going to stop right there. That's basically you described a big portion of my life. So if I liked something, I automatically assumed God didn't want it. That's how much I, I was twisting my understanding and got many OCD sufferers like twisting concepts like surrender, take up your cross, denying yourself. It's a very twisted concept. So you look at everything through this heavy law burden thing of, oh, I like that, got to give it up. Oh, I like that, got to give it up. And it comes from a distorted view of God. And I, I didn't know, I didn't understand how to live in delight and enjoyment with God. I didn't have a good reference in my life to connect to God's love. Me neither. I, I, I'm with you. My parents were emotionally distant and strict. Well, that'll definitely do it. 
That'll definitely fuel what you're expressing. I go to a very legalistic church with scary looking, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm laughing, with scary, scary looking creatures. <laughs> they're scary looking. They're not just scary, they're scary looking. <laughs> what does scary looking mean? That always scream at you. I'm, I'm laughing, you know, forgive me, because this is awful. If this is true, you, you, need to, you need to leave that church. There's no need to be screamed at. We're, you know, it's, we, we can speak the truth. We can speak it in love. We can do it in ways. Um, pastors need to, need to demonstrate what it's like to be a father and speak to people from a father's heart because that's what our world needs. That's what our church needs. We need the heart of a father. We got too many slaves just yelling at people. They're, because they're reproducing their slavery mentality. Because if I scream at you, I can manipulate you to, 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 to do what I want you to do. If I love you, I free your ability to make your own decision, and I respect that, even though I can still exhort you. It's a lot harder work. I can't seem to see God as loving and merciful. Sometimes when I meet nice people, I would see them nicer than God. I feel like he's a joy killer that makes a bunch of rules just because. Whenever I ask God to come to my aid, I feel like he's ignoring me just like my parents did. I had to perform for my parents just so I can get some affirmation from them, and that's how I relate to God as well. I'm just broken, and I need healing. Well, it's good you recognize that. Um, you know, sometimes when I address these questions, I'll, I'll be, like, nice about it, but let me just get to the point. Just you, you need to get out of that church. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Because find, find a fellowship. And if you have to take time to detox for a while till you find something else, find something else. But it's um, you need to find your freedom and your healing. And you've got to work through mom and dad wounds for sure. We all do. Everybody does. Everybody has imperfect experiences that they need to heal through. It's okay. How do I deal with guilt that rises up when I'm being happy? Oh, this kind of ties into the previous one. Sometimes I feel guilty for being happy. Yeah, that's a sign that guilt runs your life. Yep. Like me being happy is actually me loving my life, and then I feel like I shouldn't do that when I think of John 12, 25. Oh, anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so you interpret that as you having enjoyment as a bad thing. Even though joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So yeah, it's twisting that. It's twisting that. Jesus, when he was speaking to this issue, you know, he talks about if you try to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose it for my sake, you're going to find it. Um, there is what he's wanting us to do is to let go of self-preservation. We're always trying to like preserve our life. And he's like, let it go. Like, just let that go. Let go of that stress and pressure of like trying to make all these things happen. Like, let it go. And then you're going to find it. And, and, and that's, that's the, goes to that more, that let it go. But OCD sufferers twist that. And so if they feel enjoyment, they're like, this is wrong. So Jesus is not saying um, hating your life in that, like how we express it nowadays where people go, I hate my life. You know, God's not going, oh, that's awesome. You're miserable. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that I'm not trying. I don't, the world and all its goals doesn't have a hold on me. I got to be somebody. I got to be something. I've let that all go. It's basically hatred in my opinion. So that I, it now falls into its place. That, because Jesus is about seek first the kingdom and these things will be added unto you. So we're always fussing about where we're at, my career and this and my status and, and this in life and my career and all the stuff we're going to go to. Do you notice that's like the big value of the world? And it's in the church everywhere. You know, what position do you have? Where do you think you're going with your career? And, just, and those things are not evil, but they become deterrents. And Jesus goes, just let it go. Let it go, seek me, and learn to walk with me. Delight, uh, the psalmist said, delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. So it's just like putting that delight. Like, you know what? God, I just delight in you. And in my day, I'm going to let each moment 
be an opportunity to enjoy you and appreciate all that you've had. I've had to learn, but it started with me learning who God is as a loving father. That's where the healing journey began for me. And so your, your pathway is similar to the previous question. So next question is, what is love? What is love? So I'm going to actually do a video series on what is love. I've been working on it for a while. And Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. I'm going to get to that. Try to, try to give some parameters of what is love. But here's the question. Do I even know what love truly is? I can answer this in a simple way. The Bible tells us about it in 1 Corinthians 13 and John 4. 1 John 4, but I think that these words need deeper revelation in my heart because even though I know all these verses, I see a great lack of love for myself and in my relationship with God. Yes, and I think if anyone who's honest can also see that too. So if someone would tell me that God wants the best for me and that he wants to make me whole and give me enjoyment in life, pleasure and freedom, I would probably say, well, I don't know. Maybe he wants good things for me, but not the best. I have a legalistic background. Well, there you go. Sport fitness. I'm, I'm assuming you mean you enjoy sports and fitness. Loving your girlfriend with your whole heart was seen as something sinful. Yeah, well, I understand that. It's like, oh, that relationship's coming before God. And there is times where that can happen, but many people took it the wrong way. So they, they didn't see enjoying a relationship as something that is actually a beautiful thing that God's given us. If I would not have the courage to give up on all that for God's glory. Right. Yeah, this sounds OCD-like. <clears throat> it's, it's twisting. It's twisting those kind of scriptural concepts. I know that anything can become an idol when we try to fill a void only God can fill, but these words and many others were very toxic. Thank, you. Thanks a lot, Mark. God bless you. Yeah, I'm going to do some more on what is love and what is what does it look like in our life and our journey. It's a very multifaceted word, so it's, it's challenging, but I'm trying to, in simple, um, also biblically supported ways, you know, express that so we can understand love. But I think because you were raised in legalism, it's, it's, it's going it, to, anything that has enjoyment in it is going to be seen as wrong. So that's going to take some time to learn how to detox that, to learn how to actually enjoy God's presence and learn how to enjoy who he is. Go through my stuff on condemnation. So when I give you when I give you a word topic, just type in Mark DeJesus and condemnation. Type in Mark DeJesus grace. Type in Mark DeJesus guilt, and you'll see talks that I've given on that, if I can be a voice to that in your life. But find stuff that's going to help you. And maybe you've been in, maybe those of you who have been so deep in legalistic backgrounds, have been spiritually abusive. I, I've done a, a series on that. My wife and I did some episodes, and then we... Um, I did a teaching series on it. It's all, it's all free. You can access all of that. Just type in Mark de Jesus and then spiritual abuse. You'll find it. How, what about how to develop consistency when you can't stick to anything? Who's got that problem? Raise your hand. Who's got that problem? Raise your hand. Uh, what is the most effective way to develop consistency in the process of mental healing when you have difficulty sticking to anything? Okay, so... If you have mental health healing that you're recognizing, the last thing you need is overwhelming yourself. So if you're struggling to stick to anything, you may have procrastination. You may have some depression going on, right? Because depression fuels that lack of desire. So it's just like, eh. And many people going through that and they don't recognize that. So they're, and they're hard on themselves. I don't feel like reading God's word. I don't feel, okay, you're going through a season. You go, I don't feel like reading God's word. I must not be a Christian. It's like, no, you're going through something right now. We're so hard on ourselves. Oh my goodness. So when you don't have difficult, when, when, you, when you start things and you don't finish them or you don't stick with them, this goes down to a couple things. One, it goes to your upbringing. Our parents, one of the things that they're, they need to do is help us to learn how to stick with things. And so many people, you grow up, you know, you go and you play an instrument. Mom, dad, I want to play the instrument. Okay. Mom, dad, I'm sick of it. Okay, you don't have to do it. Mom, dad, I want to do this. Mom, dad, I... there's, as parents, we do need to teach our kids to stick with something. It doesn't mean when they're, you know, seven and they start playing the piano and they hate it, that they need to play it for the rest of their life. But you need to stick with a season of it. 
That's that's part one. Because then we're conditioned to enhance the quitter. The quitter becomes loud. And when you feed the quitter, go to the gym. I don't feel like. Go to the. I don't feel like. Oh God. Yeah. You become very easily pulled when the resistance rises up. Quit. So what you'll need is you'll need practice of what it means to work through resistance. What I would suggest is, first of all, look at where you're at. What is it that you want and why do you want it? When I get to the why, I get deeper to the motivation. So for me and my mental health journey, my what is I want to live in peace and I want to I want to have wholeness in my life. And I want that with every fiber of my being. You can walk, you can want anything you want. I have friends that wanted wealth. They want a big business. They want big ministry. You can have it. I just want peace. I want to live in peace. We're a way where I can cultivate peace in my life. Why do I want it? Because I want to live a fruitful life of my have I want to have a family. I want to be married. I want to have children. And I want to help my family. And I want to live to my full capacity. And I want that. So every day, I live by that. That's my, my why. Now, part of motivation too is what will my life be like if I do nothing? And one day, I talk about this in relationship OCD. One day, I said, if I continue this pattern, I will be 70 and alone. Nothing wrong with, I'm not condemning anyone 70 and alone. I'm just saying for my journey, I said, if I continue this path, I will be alone because my relationship patterns were very dysfunctional and I had to stop blaming everyone else. I had to stop um, justifying my patterns. I needed to learn new patterns. So seeing that picture stirred me. It shook me up. It was a little bit of like an Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, when he has those, you know, the Christmas carol, where he has those whatever he sees Christmas past Christmas and he wakes up and he's like, Whoa, I got to take, it's like a sobering moment. Right. And, and, and sometimes we need a sobering moment, not a condemning. Oh, my life is going to go. No, you know, no, it's, it's sober. Be sober, be vigilant, awake, alert. Okay. I got to snap out of it. How do I do that? Get to my why and get to my, what will happen if I do nothing? I got to connect to that. Okay, I have the power to change. And then one thing in front of the other. And start simple. Start simple. It's like, so I, I was like, I don't have a great prayer life and I don't know how to be still. So I would, I, I would go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be still for an hour. Oh my goodness. It was like torture. So I was like, I'm going to be still for one minute. Okay, that's all I can handle. Most people, see, this is the thing. Most people can't handle that. It's like, one minute, what's the matter with you, Mark? Mm, exactly, there's the inner critic. There's the nasty, condemning Pharisee voice. Well, I said, minute, that's what I can do right now. Do one minute of silence, put my hand over my heart. God, you love me, and I just thank you for your love right now. I'm just going to breathe in your love for me. What about Bible reading? Couldn't even read the Bible. Can't read the Bible. I got, I got hundreds of people writing to me spinning. I don't, I don't read my Bible enough, right? It's okay right now. It doesn't mean that's going to be permanent. Then I go and I'd, I'd open up to this. All right, God, you know I have a hard time sometimes spinning out. And I find areas where I could sense God's love empowering me. Okay, all right, I'm just going to park here for a bit. And then that one minute turned into two minutes, turned into five minutes, turned into... And today I can freely sit. My favorite friends, you know, you know who my best friends are? Uh, one, my best friend's name is Peace. My other best friend's name is Quiet. And, and I like when they hang out together. And I tell my kids, hey, I'm going to hang out with Peace and Quiet. We're going to have some, we're going to hang out. <laughs> they know exactly what I'm talking about. That's coming a long way from a guy 20 years ago that couldn't sit still for 30 seconds. Because I know the power of momentum. One minute. Because all you need is like a little win. Just a little win. I'm like, oh, and celebrate the little wins. Maybe you need to have a daily Thanksgiving routine that you do. You know, I'm just going to take two minutes and just 
lay out a couple things I'm thankful for. In my anxiety disorders, I give out 10 action steps, right? And I tell people, just start with one of them. Just put it, because you don't learn the things in the kingdom unless something is put into action. You don't learn it and then do it. You learn in the doing. That's where God meets you. The, the action is out of the boat on the water. We're all sitting in the boat with our notepads. Like, I got to uh, I got to figure this out. And it's like, God's going, just get out there. Just start walking on water. I don't know. I don't know that I'm prepared. I don't know that I have enough. I got to get, I got to get enough. No. No. All right, let me see what else is going on here. Okay. How to focus. My question is. My question is, how do I not get too introspective as I can struggle with this, but also work on areas that need healing? It's hard to know if I should focus on the rejection mindset, learning God's fatherly love, OCD struggles, or my identity as a son of God. Thanks, Mark. Well, which which one is really speaking the most? Now, what you mentioned, those all kind of tie into each other, Right. But love is the greatest. So focus there. So how do you get to, uh, how do you stop from being introspective? I did a video on that, how I stopped introspection. We got to recognize first it's unhealthy. Otherwise you'll keep doing it. Introspection's like constantly inward searching. You need to get more into relationship. You need to get more out talking to people. You got to get out of your head and relationally because you can't be introspective while talking to someone while sharing with them. It's impossible. You're either doing one or the other. So, um, but you have to recognize it's it's a destructive habit. Otherwise, you'll keep falling to it. How do I face my fear of Christian television? I'm having anxiety when it comes to watching watching Christian television. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm making a joke, but I was wondering if to overcome the fear, I should watch it little by little while still afraid or avoid it until I watch. I don't know that I'm a huge fan of Christian television myself. There's a lot of fabrication, a lot of fabrication, a lot of performance driven, make everything look just right. I don't, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's not my thing. I enjoy just being here, being myself, doing that. I mean, there's a lot of pull. I know people that pull for that. They want that. I've had people tell me I should. I just, I've, you know, there are pathways you can take if you want that. want to go on that. It's just, at least at this stage in my life, that's that's not my thing either. I don't really watch Christian television myself. I feel like there's um, there's there's a lot of teaching that that doesn't invite people to work on the issues of the heart. There's a lot of cliches, a lot. It's a lot of performance driven stuff. It's um, so I don't think you have. If you, I don't know that there's something that you have to do there. That's just my opinion. Okay. So I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to, I'll check. Let me check over here. Whoa, got a bunch of stuff here. Okay. Mark, what is the balance between grace and the law? There's no such thing. (laughs) Uh, The law is an inferior covenant. The law is an inferior covenant leading to the the covenant of grace. It's not like they're sitting there. We need to balance ourselves between the two. One had to make way for the next. The law helped us to see sin. By the law's presence, we sin now became evident. And that's what the law does. It exposes sin with no solution. Grace brings solution and freedom over it. So, sorry, I get lost here and sometimes scrolling through and I lose my place. Uh, But what if it's my flesh that doesn't want to read my Bible? I find that, I find that the way that we use the flesh, it's like, we're always, oh, it's my, it's my flesh. Like, I, I, When, when the Bible uses the word flesh, we have to know the context. The, the word flesh, I think it's the Greek word sarx. It has like 15 different definitions. So 
It could be the the meat you're eating. It could be um, it could be talking about Paul when he's saying about the old you. You know, the, the, the flesh being the old you. Um, there's aspects of the flesh of like just human energy, you know, and human effort. It could be talking about the old you that wants to keep rising up. What Paul said, there's nothing good in me that is in my flesh where sin dwells, the being of sin, the noun of sin, you know, it's not me that does it, but sin that dwells within me. So if you don't want to read the Bible, I wouldn't, is it my flesh? Is it me? Is it not like Christians really get lost in that? Okay. If you don't want to read the Bible, let's, let's not condemn it. Let's get to why. So we, so God can heal that and empower you. You know, it's like if you're married and you go, I don't feel like going out with my wife on a date. Do you go, is that my flesh? Is this me? Is it, is it? You just go, no, you go, okay, what's going on? So that we get back to healthy desire. I don't know. I feel like sometimes we get lost in some metrics of trying to figure things out. If you don't feel like reading the Bible, I, I would say how you're being taught to read the Bible is probably a big downer. When the Bible, when, when I went through a renovation, the Bible came to life. And ever since then, it's been 15 years. I delight in the word of God, but I, I, I was a pastor and wasn't reading my Bible. A lot of pastors aren't reading their Bible. I was reading a lot of other books and things and church growth stuff. And I I'd, I'd whip out the Bible just on Sundays or for, or for you know, sermon. I'm just being honest. This is, you know, we're talking 20 years ago, but when God did a renovation, I'm healing my broken heart. And I said, God, I, I want to know. So if you're stuck re- in reading the Bible, first of all, I don't condemn you. I'm not going to yell at you and scream at you. It's all right. But here's what I suggest. Say, God, I don't feel like reading the Bible. Would you help me? Because I want to see you for who you really are. And, and when we experience him, he's life. He's life. So if you feel that being pulled away or you don't feel like something is in the frequency range of how you're being taught or what you're going through. And the cool thing is that God's not like, he's so patient. He's so, so patient with you. So I just want to just encourage you in that love and, um, I want to live in peace, but I don't love myself. Well, have you read my book? Because I would, I would encourage you to go through the book. Because loving yourself, I, I, I break down what it is, what it's not. Because people are like, oh, loving yourself, that's a weird. You know, you know. I break down what it is. But it's basically you coming into agreement with how God sees you. It starts with a choice. It doesn't start with feeling it. You have to understand, because I know your question, I'm going to get, you had a question about loving God. It starts with a decision. It starts with you deciding. This is where I, I'm choosing to say yes to God's love for me, no matter what screams up in you. And you'll have to set your compass. Your feelings will argue with you for a while. You set your compass and keep moving towards that until your emotional world comes into alignment with where you've decided. I wish I'd recognized many things I just didn't 40 years ago. I'm with you. I'm with you. I wish that I knew what I know now when I was younger. But I wouldn't have listened when I was younger. (laughs) So that's why you know what you know now, because now you're ready for it. Thank God for his grace. Thank you, God, that your timing is great and you're gracious. You don't waste anything, even though we think we waste it. I can't understand my, I can't understand why my son is a hundred pounds overweight and his room looks like a nuclear war zone. He starts and stops diet exercises, plans, he'll clean his room and it'll last about a day. He's got a broken heart. He just doesn't realize it. 
I know it's connected to the dysfunction of my husband and I, who both came out of dysfunctional families, but not sure how it transferred to that behavior. Yeah. Start with just letting God heal you. Be gracious to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. A lot of parents beat themselves up. Oh, my kid's messed up because of me. It's, that doesn't help. You just, but, but let God work on you and let that reflect. So when a parent starts getting healing, they become more compassionate to be able to talk with their child and talk through things. And then you can partner with their growth and their journey. And I think that's the goal. What steps are there to work on when you're mad at God, when you aren't supposed to be and make the solutions of problems the priority? Look on my YouTube page. I talk about when you're mad at God. I talk about that. I'm wondering with your OCD videos, do you recommend watching them in order? Uh, go to my page, markdehesus.com OCD help. markdehesus.com forward slash OCD help. Yeah, watch them from top to bottom. Go right through them. And watch them a bunch of times, especially the seven distortions you got to become aware of your seven distortions or else you'll keep going in the same pattern, same pattern, same patterns. Um, okay. I wanted to ask you what your input is on how to overcome struggling reading the Bible after coming out of legalism. It's hard to read it sometimes through the right lens. Okay, so the right lens, it's, it's, it's telling me that you have some perfectionism That's that legalism fuels perfectionism. Perfectionism, I got to do things just right, just right, just right. That's a a standard that is um, never going to fulfill. You just won't be able to fulfill that. Instead, um, here's a couple things I would share with you. Um, Take a break just for a little bit. Just take a break. Because you want to starve that guilt that, oh my goodness, I'm not reading. God's mad at me. Because that's the legalism will tell you that. And the thing I could say is it where you start. A lot of times I find people have some help when they go into places like 1 John 4, the Gospel of John, sometimes Romans 8. Um, find an area where you can understand the goodness and love of God and park there. Because without the goodness and love of God, the whole Bible doesn't make sense. It just doesn't you'll see God is mad. You just It doesn't put things into context. When love and grace gets put, it puts everything into context. You read something, you kind of go, you, you get context better. Other thing I would recommend is change translation. And I'll tell you why. When we read the Bible in the same translation over and over and over again, there's parts of us that go into autopilot. So we don't take in a meaning. And there's a lot of translations. They're not perfect. Uh, if I was to teach doctrine, I don't know that I would use paraphrases. I would probably use the word for words if I was teaching doctrine, right? When you're just reading it, take things in. Try a different translation because it will give you like a fresh lens to read it. And, and, and I, I, I thank God for that because I know people argue about translation and stuff like that. I don't have my, I don't have a fight in that. You know, I understand the arguments, I understand the things and that and this, and I've researched it. I, I appreciate that there's things that certain translations can bring out. And so that's where I would start. And and you want to, like the, the way that I often do, God, I, I would open the Bible, say, I put my hand over my heart. God, I, wanted, I want your heart on the matter. I would receive your heart. And I would let myself process through. And when something's helpful, just stay there for a little bit. Read it again and again, and then maybe journal it, and then maybe memorize it. Uh, for me, um, I read Psalm 139 in the NIV. I was a King James, New King James person most of my life. And then I just started reading the NIV, and I, and I, I was in Psalm 139, and I just I, I got so touched by it, and I memorized it. It was just really helping me. It was one of the first things that started my heart healing journey. So anyways, hope that helps you, brother. Hope that helps you a lot. Be encouraged. Oh, cool. The body dysmorphic. Okay, that's cool. I'm glad that helped. I woke up this morning feeling bad for not reading the Bible. Yeah, that's guilt. Yeah, it's not God. He just goes, just come to the table. Just come to the table.
you know, I'm sorry to hear, I see somebody writing about a drug, a drug addict husband. It won't help himself. It's, it's incredibly difficult being married to an addict, especially when the addict doesn't get severe, intense help. They got to really want it. Otherwise, they will um, spread their toxicity. You know, and then for so long, the church has been like, well, just stay with him and just love him because God hates divorce as though God hates divorce and loves everything else. It's like, this is dysfunctional, you know? So I pray for you that you have grace in your decisions and, and, and make those strong decisions for love and for truth. So my heart goes out to you. I'm going in the transition of seeing God as loving, but I still struggle. Sometimes I think of how loving he is and get relaxed, but other times he seems like he'll cast me away at end times for failing. Yeah, that's, that's, um, you kind of, you're in the flow of it. Like you, you go in and you taste of the goodness, but then it's like, ah, that old stuff just starts coming back in. That's normal. You're, you're in renewal. You're in renewal. So I'll t- I'll deal with one more here. Um, this was this was in two parts, and then there was an email. It's about marriage. It's not really about mental health; it's more about marriage. But it does have. Um, let me see if I can break it down here. I'm gonna. I when when you send in questions, I leave personal info out. So sometimes when you see me reading, I'm adjusting because I'm leaving like names and stuff. Uh, So here's the question. I have a question about retroactive jealousy, OCD. Gotcha. From a Christian perspective. So you got like an OCD, jealous over something, retro over stuff that's happening in the past, but it's like now affecting you now. How to deal with a spouse's sinful sexual deeds before marriage Mental images, questions, questions about spouse's morals since spouse knew that he was sinning, but repeated behavior a few times anyways. Very difficult to accept and understand how someone with Christian teaching can behave like this. I think this affects many some couples. Things can be fine for a long time, but come up when Children hit puberty, start dating. This affects marriage and faith because you feel like a bad Christian since you can't forgive and accept this. Then there was another part where you said in an email, okay, OCD runs in my childhood family heavily. So, okay, that's a big signal to me. So you got, now we got the OCD. I'm going to do more OCD stuff tomorrow. I'm really struggling to accept my husband's sexual sins in his youth. So, you have to understand that if you have OCD and you see it running in your family and you see it happening in your life, OCD makes Christians obsessed and fearful with sin in a law-based perfectionistic way. It's intense. So the more obsessed you become with it, the more it grows, then you try to fix it. The problem is you're trying to fix something in the past that cannot be changed, right? And so um, my wife and I t- talk about this a lot. In fact, honey, if you're, if, if, you're, if you're watching this, can you come over to the office, jump in? Maybe you can talk with me of this a little bit, this, uh, some more. She was taking care of some other things right now. So, But if you're here, come on in. Maybe you can, <laughs> maybe you can jump into this conversation a bit. Because when, when Melissa and I got together, one of the things that we really believe strongly is a healthy perspective regarding sin. Is that like sin is sin. We don't we don't compromise what sin is. But we are big believers in God's grace to have compassion upon sin. And that's our goal. And sin is not you. It's not who you are. Unless you want it to be. So in marriage, we all come together with sin issues. All different kinds. Now, sexual sin does it does have an impact in how it affects things in, in some in some unique ways, certainly. Certainly. But when we come together, there's there's mistakes, there's things, there's patterns, there's you know, you have people that have actual, you know, they have uh, fornicated, there's a lot of pornography addiction stuff going on. And people have in their history with the especially with the invention of the internet and the web and, and smartphones, right? 
pornography addiction is a major thing. And so we come together in marriage. We come together with a lot of sins. But is the sin, oh, you want to come in, jump in? Yeah. Come in for a second. You might have to um, grab. Hold on, hold on just a second. <laughs> you did hear me. That's great. I did hear you. I was oh, doing the dishes. You might have to scoot over. I don't, I don't, I don't have an idea. Or maybe you know what? I can do this. Grab your microphone. See the oh, full reach. Oops. Do you want me to just hold it? Could you? I'll mute it while you're fiddling with it. Here, I'll help you. There we go. Could you hold that? Yeah. Would that work? Hold on. I think so. Hello. Okay, so, <laughs> so all right, so speak to this. Um, I've been in Q&A mode, as you know. Mm -hmm. So, all right, so this question came in, basically, I was talking about the perspective on sin when couples come together, the compassion to have the sin, not being you, but also I think that like in marriage, we also have to establish what's our heart. Correct. In moving forward. Right. So what would you like me to, um, I'm laughing. You're holding it like, I know I, I'm like sorry. A, like an ice cream. <laughs> cone. <laughs> it is. Well, I'm not used to this. Okay. Right. Um, so anyways, so in the email, I, I have a so in the email, OCD's this. here, okay? Right. Been married 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, they see the contamination OCD in one of their children, okay? okay? Religious OCD. And then she took a evangelism class, mm -hmm. and now she's anxious about not spreading the gospel enough. Okay. So to me, it shows a very distorted family view on the Christian life and sin, Right. Like I, I'm obsessed about, I got to evangelize enough. I got So it's going to really mess up how we see sin. Absolutely. And I okay. think, and I think that when you come into marriage, we all have sin issues we come into marriage with. Right. And I think that it's first of all, recognizing, first of all, sin is not you. Your past is not you, but what's your heart and what you're going to do with it. Right. And how the two of you relate to each other about those things. Mm -hmm. So we probably need to do a longer video on this because it's hard to just kind of capture well, a couple as, things. Go as far as you can. But I, so for us, we, and I referenced this in the last podcast that we did together, we had two very broken histories that we brought, but very different broken histories when it came to relating to the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. And, um, we made a decision early on and I'm grateful for it because of what we were moving towards as far as healing and love that we were going to really deal with each other as brothers and sisters in Christ first. And this was, we were like a month into dating <laughs> when we were having these conversations because we had some things to tackle and, um, you were very loving. You were very safe for me. And I think I want to be careful even in how I talk about it because I, I think that people can spiral going, well, I don't have that. How do I get that? We've been married for so long. How do I get that? I don't know what to do. We're already mm -hmm. in patterns. Right. So um, I want to be careful even in how I talk about it because we, it was difficult. We went through some difficult times and how we were choosing to process each other's history safely. Mm -hmm. And there is an element of that when you are looking at someone through right. their, through decisions that they've made. It's, it's, you know, marriage is the ultimate covenant of, of, of closeness and you see right. everything right. on someone. Right. Um, we have a decision to make of how we're going to see the person. And I think Christianity sees people according to their sins. I think we, we do. do. Now there's a problem. Yeah. There's a problem because sometimes in marriages, like there will be adultery or there'll be a spouse has a pornography struggle. And there are times where they're like, well, it wasn't me. It was the sin within me. And you got to be nicer to me. And it's like, no, you got to take responsibility too. 
Correct. So, so it's love, but we have to take responsibility for the sin in our life. In, in this situation, we're talking about sins that were happening, sexual sins in youth. Uh, it sounds like before marriage, right? right? Um, there is a difference between before you got into the relationship and then in the midst and of And then it. in the middle. Yeah. Correct. If someone is, conti- is this person continuing patterns or is it just? Not that I can see. And, I, and, I, and I, I'm trying to guard some of their private information. Correct. That, that okay. is in there. Right. But, but when you see o- religious OCD, know that that's going to rule over everything. It's Correct. Gonna, it's going to make you very black and white perfectionistic and very intense. And then it's like the elephant in the room. You can't even see it. So it's, um, it does take a journey of like, you need to be able, I felt like in our marriage, I saw you as who you were becoming, like as your, I saw your identity in Christ. And I, and I, and I, and I, I don't know how to sometimes transfer that mindset to people because it but, takes it takes a, a, a work of the heart to but do. But can that. I say you first saw your own identity in Christ, right? And I think that that's an important piece that you know, right? We, so we miss. Let me let me jump in real okay. quick. Okay. So if so if if I'm obsessed about if a spouse is obsessed about the other spouse's sexual sin, they're probably not connected to their own sin. Correct. Like, well, I grew up, and Jesus would say, you had a thought of adultery. Right. You can you committed it by just your thought, right? And well, it goes the, back and, to the and, right, and, go and ahead. what it does is it levels the playing field. We all have struggles, all battles. But right. it's but it's not diminishing sin. It's putting it in this proper perspective. Well, really it's the ultimate in Christianity when you understand what you've been forgiven of. Right. And what Christ did for you, then you have a better lens in processing the other person. Right. And what so then it le- it's like first perspective of it's not, not, it's not, you know, Paul said, it's not me. This, we have to, we have to really gain an understanding of sin that it's not us, even though it might be working through us or we've had difficulties. We got to clear the shame out because with it, with shame in the picture, we're never going to deal with anything. Well, we're never going to be safe. We're never going to heal. It's going to be the same thing. We'll just hide it. And then I'm, I'm a big proponent on the want to like, what's your desire what's your heart and if your heart is to be free live that right but it this is where i'm heading if we're talking strictly about marriage Hmm. it has to be two people doing that together to ultimately grow the marriage if the other spouse wants nothing to do with it and is like oh that christianity thing that's your thing those we have bigger fish to fry Hmm. we're we're talking about two people that want to grow their marriage Hmm want to get closer and want those things to be that right. that you're not wearing the person's not wearing it every time you look at them. Right. And it's your attitude towards sin for your own and theirs. Right. And we should probably do a bit longer thing on it. We're doing it. Well, you know. So uh, so yeah. like I think though that the 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 heavy obsessiveness is 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 the is a is going to be a big problem because even you've said you've tried to find help. Uh, I've understood that weakness towards OCD is often genetic. Now, when I'm listening, it sounds that it is mine and my husband's fault. Okay, when you get into that, it's our fault. That's not going to allow you to heal. You know, that's that shame. My kids messed up because of me. Right. And so it goes back to, and I think and I even heard you saying, when you when you tend to your own healing journey and you start to get a grace and understanding about your own pain, then you can join with your children in humility. Okay, you know what? Mom and dad went through some stuff and right. we maybe didn't do the best, but now let's work together to move forward. The shame and blame, um, that doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, right, but, right, right. Yeah, that's why the love, uh, love and grace is so important because then it puts things into perspective. Correct. But it's also tough because you sit down and go, "All right, what are we going to do?" You've got issues. I've got issues. We're all working through them. And I think the more compassionate you are to yourself, the more compassionate you are to your children, to your spouse, in reasonably 
right. walking together. And when when the Bible talks about, you know, there being truth in the light and you having fellowship, fellowship just isn't like, hey, want to hang out with your neighbor and have dinner. Fellowship happens in the family when you have truth that's on the table. You know, we're really big on if, if our kids hear us have an argument, they also hear, hey, you know what, mom and dad, we're working, we're working something out. We put truth on the table. Now they don't need to know all the nuts and bolts of arguments, but they, they hear and see relationship and fellowship happening so that then they know how to have truth in wrongdoings, in, in all of those things that then you ultimately still carry out relationship in it. Right. Right. Because you, you, you parent relating to your kids versus like we have a, we, we, I, I, I find many parents are really beating themselves up. And it's like, no, God is a redemptive God. And it's very powerful if you'll get present in the moment and humble your heart and be compassionate towards yourself and reflect that towards your kids. Um, they'll appreciate that more than you being a perfect parent. Right. And really the love your neighbor as yourself, your kids are your neighbors. Your spouse is your neighbor. Mm -hmm. it, it applies to everything. If you aren't applying love and grace to yourself, how do you give it out to anyone else? Mm -hmm. I, and I, I would suggest as an application, um, as a family, you know, go through some of my materials on OCD, mm. you know, go through some of those, those root distortions, the perfectionism, things like that. Um, but I think most of all, I want to speak to your heart in writing this question about how you see yourself, because how you see yourself will, will drive how you see, um, your husband, mm -hmm. you know? He says, I, I, you know, you struggle with intimacy. You feel like you can't accept him. Um, we see others through what we have processed and how we see ourselves in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And, and I want to empower you um, because I find a dramatic difference in how I am as a husband when I love myself versus when I don't, when oh, I don't, really? it's, it's just, <laughs> it's just not fun. No. And Paul said, a man who loves his wife loves himself. And I hit a pause on that and I go, hmm, that's interesting. So out of his healthy love for himself, he loves his wife. And we got all these husbands that are like irritable and, you know, right. got anger issues, addiction issues, whatever. They don't love themselves. Correct. And then they want their wives to be something for them. And then they're, you know, yeah. creates all these different problems. So anyways, oh, I just. Did, I, did that help? Did well, I? Well, I hope it. Some I input. hope it did. I hope it did. Well, it was. You know what's funny? It was. I had a series of questions, and then mm -hmm. I have. I have some that I put for tomorrow, and this was the last one on here. And I said, you know what? Let's just. Let's just do it. Nice. So. Um, what do you do with parent relationships that bear very toxic, and won't go to counseling or admit anything's wrong? Let them, let them go. <laughs> yeah. What do you do with parent really? Um, yeah. Work on yourself and then ultimately make your boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways. Got it, boo. Well, two hours. I think that's some, <laughs> some, some good meat today. Thanks for jumping in. And thanks for everyone listening to this episode and being a part of this broadcast. We want to empower marriages. We want to empower who you are. I'll jump in, do some more tomorrow. And uh, same time, same channel. And then I will be taking, we will be taking some sabbatical time. We'll be taking a break. And um, that's going to be a good thing for our hearts as we're processing through just refreshment and just overall wholeness in our life and in our journey. So I pray this is a blessing to your life. I pray it adds value to what you're going through. And I look forward to seeing you all in future episodes. God bless.